obviously this has been a year like no other. And uh, you know, this is sort of Greg's baby and his thought process, but fellowship is, is a year where you learn a lot of technique and, and surgical decision-making, but it's for many of us, it was a year where we got to meet a lot of the experts in the field and, and le learn right from them about their thought processes. Obviously with COVID, um, we've not really been able to do that. Um, with traditional conferences and a lot of the East Coast conferences just you know, don't make sense from a West Coast um, time frame. And so the idea was to try to have a conference just for us on West Coast time so that our fellows could hear from some of the experts in the field directly. Um, we tried to emphasize, unlike some of the other Zoom meetings, not to have this promote a single institution or relationship, but just to sort of be truly about spine surgery and fellow education. Um, and uh, the great thing is we've got so many awesome spine surgeons on the West Coast that we can have, you know, a really robust, uh, I think, discussion and series without verging from, you know, California and, and Washington and Oregon. So uh, really excited about our, our group of speakers. We're going to start doing it every other month. So um, six this year, and we'll kind of see how it goes from there. Um, but so far, we've had a, a great response. So without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kleinberg, and maybe I'll turn it over to you, Greg, since, since you know Eric best. Uh. It may be good or bad. I don't know. <laughs> no, Eric is, uh, if you guys don't know Eric, um, you should do anything you can to at least sit down with him and have a chat with him. He's a truly remarkable individual. He's a fantastic human being, um, first and foremost. Um, he's also a relentless academician and a leader in his field, a leader for residents and fellows, and a leader in his department where he's vice chair. And, uh, He's done an amazing job at UC Davis, really turning things around uh, uh, academically. And um, he's now on the executive committee at the ISSG, so he's got a tremendous amount of influence um, in our circles. And um, they put him in charge of the complications group, which I'm not sure is really a reflection of, of anything. I'm not saying anything. Um, but uh, Eric, we're, we're so pleased to have you as a first speaker um, and uh, just wanted to um, uh, hand it over to you and say, take it away. Thanks so much for being here and for taking the time to doing this. Welcome, everybody. Right on. Well, thanks for having me. So I think, Hani, I think we uh, recorded a, a little bit of that lecture. If you have that, we can just pull it up and run it. Uh, if not, I, I can get my slides. Right on. This is great. Greg, it's just nice to get us all together, even if it's a, on a Zoom call. It still uh, feels better than nothing, doesn't it? Yeah, it's it, very true. Very true. All right, good morning. Um, just want to say thank you to Hani and Greg in particular for uh, setting this all up. And um, I'm excited to be uh, the inaugural speaker for this West Coast Fellows Conference. Again, the idea is, is to kind of kick off a, a quick topic and uh, give you guys some things to think about uh, for your fellowship year. So I'm going to talk to you about options for iliac screw trajectory. So uh, I have no conflicts with any of this. So we know uh, there's lots of reasons to place iliac bolts. So long fusions extend to the sacrum. So uh, usually for me, that's about L2 or greater, particularly uh, for females, we want to protect the sacral screws. We know that there's a high non-union at the lumbosacral junction, uh, even with inner body. Uh, certainly osteopenia or osteoporosis creates a greater problem. High-grade spondies and obviously trauma to that area uh, are all great indications for iliac bolt fixation. Um, there's also a long-standing history. So Harrington started this in the 1960s, and uh, they had a sacral bar where they would uh, lever it into the sacrum. Um, however, the pseudo pseudoarthrosis rate at the, was nearly 40% at the lumbosacral junction. Luke A uh, did it with uh, uh, wires and co Cotrell du USA in 1980s. Uh, uh, and the Galveston technique was really invented with uh, solid bars, uh, which, which were then placed into the ilium uh, and then levered into the rest of the spine, mostly used for uh, neuromuscular scoliosis. And now with modern instrumentation and polyaxial screws, we can place screws in multiple different trajectories and patterns not to maximize the fixation in the pelvis and ilium. Uh, S1 sacral screws, these are really the workhorse of sacral uh, fixation. Uh, we place these all the time. Uh, I really think about placing these tricortically, so a vault tip through the outer cortex anteriorly, uh, and then uh, place those screws line to line. So if I 
a hook and measure a 45 millimeter screw, I'd usually place a 45 millimeter screw. Um, you need to be careful that the screws are immediately because you don't want to affect the L5 nerve root. Uh, and the landmarks are the outer aspect of the L5 S1 facetula. Um, it's easily found without, with removal of the facetula and finding that ridge of the sacral ala, and this is what it looks like. So what you want to find is this confluence, kind of this auricular piece of the facet, and really that outer lateral quadrant. And that can be easily visualized and identified there on both of those images. And then the trajectory is then medial uh, and along that superior aspect so that it, it then enters that anterior aspect of the cortex. And, and this is what it looks like with the screws They're going all the way to the front and penetrating that cortex, again, immediately away from uh, the exiting L5 nerve root. Uh, S2 screws or ALO screws are really used now mostly as a bailout. Um, uh, I very, very rarely put these in. Uh, they have poor pull-out strength compared to the S1 or pelvic screws. And um, S2 has a similar trajectory as an S1 screw, but then a lower protrudable body. And an ALO screw uh, trajectory is out along that SI joint, which is uh, uh, medial to lateral and inferior to superior. Um, and this is what that looks like. So this is a tr tr traditional S2 screw, again, same trajectory. Uh, as an S1 screw, just lower in the retrieval body. And then here's that ALA screw, and you can see that it really, unfortunately, has very poor fixation in the ALA. You can see that uh, I don't even have a, an image of this, so I had to make it up uh, because uh, uh, I really never use this. Uh, and then iliac screws, and this is, uh, iliac screws are, are, can be placed in a variety of different ways. Kind of the traditional iliac screw, and you may see this in your fellowships, is when they remove uh, the poster portion of the ilium, and you'll take a large chunk of bone out so you can bury that iliac screw and then uh, place your trajectory uh, anteriorly and along that uh, uh, um, uh, corridor uh, so you can go all the way to the, from the PSIS to the AIIS. Uh, and this is what it looks like. And so uh, here's that starting point, again, along the ala, uh, and then it can traverse the entirety of the ilium getting excellent fixation the whole way. The one disadvantage though is that typically requires these offset connectors. Um, these offset connectors, unfortunately, can't add to the bulk and discomfort. Uh, and uh, sometimes those iliac bolts can be uh, uncomfortable. Because of that, uh, there has been a new advent of this uh, S2 ailer iliac screw. Uh, and this screw actually utilizes some of the um, uh, sacrum uh, and then uh, from the sacrum it traverses in the ilium. Uh, using a, a much more lateral trajectory and usually a slightly shorter screw. Uh, this was popularized by uh, Dr. Gabesh in uh, Johns Hopkins, and he's written several papers on this, on the fixation strategy and uh, uh, imaging. Oftentimes, this is done with a fluoroscopy to verify the correct position. And you can see he uh, makes an owl's eye view. So you can look at the confluence of uh, the um, uh, sacral trajectory. Uh, and then place that just above the sciatic notch to get an uh, excellent fixation. And this is what it looks like. So you can see it uh, enters into the sacrum uh, and then through the sacrum, uh, violates that SI joint and then traverses it. And the one complicated part with placing these screws uh, is, uh, is it is, uh, has a strange tactile feel as you're going through the, um, uh, that iliac, uh, the uh, SI joint, you can feel the, the uh, as you're going through. And so oftentimes you either need to drill or uh, take a look uh, on a fluoroscopy. Uh, my preferred technique is is neither of these. It's a, rather a low profile iliac screw. And, um, and I do this by uh, utilizing uh, and leaving that uh, lateral uh, margin of the posterior spirit uh, spine and uh, trying to place the screw in a tulip uh, right next to that SI joint so that it stays low and stays out of the way. The advantage is that it can be quite long, so it can use the same trajectory as a traditional iliac bolt, uh, but it can be placed in line similar to the S2 AI screw. And here's what it looks like. And so uh, you can see the entire PSIS is left intact and the, the tulip is left right next to it. And the trajectory then is lateral uh, and you can see it can be quite long uh, exiting all the way out towards the PSIS. This is what it looks like. Again, you can see it headed down the notch and all the way out towards that uh, AIS. You can see these screws can even be a little bit longer. Here's what it looks like in, in real life. This is a case we did the other day. So here's the S1 screw. Here I'm pointing to the SI joint. And then just above the SI joint, I find that sacral ala and I make a, a small burr hole uh, next to it. And here I'm going to give you a little video. Here's, here's us doing it. 
So uh, here we found that uh, that SI joint. You can find a trajectory just above it and make a small burr hole. Uh, once we violate it, uh, violated that cortex, so we can place it easily, we take a gear shift, so I like a lanky probe that's angled down, so it goes along the margin of the pedicle. Grab the PSIS and uh, and the greater trochanter. We just aim just above it, and then under freehand technique, we can kind of advance it. And then I can use a ball tip probe and uh, a place and I love a ball tip probe to kind of advance along the ilium. You can see it. We give it a kind of nice, good, vigorous push to get it down. Uh, once we get it down, uh, you can see we can have the entire uh, uh, probe in that. And so here's it snapped and you can see, essentially we can place the entirety of the probe, which is about 130 millimeters. Um, I usually am a little embarrassed to place anything that quite that long, so I just put a, a hundred millimeter by eight millimeter screws, my typical working length screw, and we can place that in that area without difficulty. And there, there it is going in. Nice thing too about placing these low iliac bolts is you can also place an accessory screw. And so here's us placing an accessory screw just above it. We wanted two, two points of fixation in the pelvis in this case because uh, of a previous fracture the patient had. And so we can drill just above it, uh, and same, same idea and trajectory. Uh, we can use a, a pedicle probe and then just go right above it, uh, same trajectory. Um, we, I usually try to triangulate those screws a little bit and get them together. All right, and, so, and this is what the construct looked like the other day. You can see uh, the bilateral iliac bolts, everything's in line, and then these are accessory rods, uh, which are placed next to it to give extra fixation. Uh, you can pull, compress, distract again, to get your final coronal alignment uh, proper. Uh, there's also triangular osteosynthesis. Again, we'll use this for fractures. Here's a, a lumbosacral fracture that we uh, took care of, uh, multiple points of fixation required. And we can do, again, those low start iliac bolts, keep them out of the way, long beefy screws heading all the way uh, to the AIIS, uh, and then supplement this with transsacral transiliac fixation uh, for ultimate fixation of the fracture and reduction in fairly acceptable alignment. All right, well, good. Uh, and with that, uh, maybe we'll uh, kick it back to the live session and uh, uh, and uh, see if there's uh, some additional questions and uh, maybe go through a couple of cases. All right, Hani, back to you, buddy. Awesome. So I don't, so I don't, so um, any questions, I, I guess, you know, there are lots of options for iliac fixation. The reason I've been a little, I don't really love the idea of the uh, S2AI screw uh, crossing that SI joint. It's always kind of bothered me that it goes across uh, a native joint that we're not trying to fuse. Um, certainly we know a lot about SI joint dysfunction. I think Dr. Eastlight's written uh, several, uh, uh, not just book chapters, but probably books on, on the subject. And so uh, we know that that's a real problem. So it just has never made sense to me to go across it. The other thing too is um, there's lots of reports and you may have seen this also in your fellowship of those S2AI screws fracturing. And so typically place, people are placing shorter, uh, thicker screws, uh, sometimes even with shanks on it to avoid that problem. Um, I have, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have to be, always be a little careful to say always and never because uh, I'm gonna go in tomorrow and find a bunch of iliac uh, screw fractures, but. I have not seen that uh, with this construct. Now, maybe it's because the rod will fracture first, but I don't see those iliac bolts fail. So um, I can do a couple, I can do a case or two. I can, uh, we can have a chat about it. Uh, whatever you guys think. Hey, Eric, I've got a question for you. What are your thoughts about taking down the uh, uh, iliocostalis muscle and even some of the sacrospinalis muscle? That ex exposure that you made by getting a, um, um, by getting a Taylor retractor all the way around the ilium. Are, are you yeah. concerned about how much exposure that takes compared to being a little more subtle? Uh, yeah. And kind of working below the sacrospinalis? No, it's a, it's, it's a good point, Seth. You know, the, it, it's actually, it's not all the, so it's not the way we used to do it with uh, where we would put a Taylor all the way around the other side. Um, you know, when uh, Sig and I would, would used to put a finger all the way in the sciatic notch and uh, put a bolt that way. Do you remember that, Sig? Um, that was... That's a dissection. Um, this, this, the way that I do this is, is I dissect out to the edge of the SI joint, which, uh, which you do for S2 AI screw. And then all I do is I take another two to three millimeters up onto the ilium. 
Um, and I leave, in fact, that entire muscle envelope attached to the PSIS, so it'll sit back over top. So um, I don't know, those pictures are always hard to show exactly what you do, but there's there's not a tailor all the way around it. There's a there's a, I use like a um, like a Langenbach or a, a, a th this T-handle tractor that I like that goes right to the edge of the PSIS, but I don't I don't to your point take any of that muscle off. And in fact, the whole I leave it purposefully, and I leave that that um, uh, that bone the PSIS bone purposefully so that the so that that uh, tulip sits underneath it. In fact, when you feel the back, even even in thin patients, all you can feel is the PSIS, and you can't actually feel the screw because it's kind of hidden underneath that muscle envelope and, uh, uh, and, and that, uh, uh, that bone. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Question. I use the same technique, Eric, with MIS because you can put that in percutaneously and you can sort of use your thumb to sort of judge where your, your uh, sacral screw is and then just plan that on a lower uh, starting point on the ilium. So great technique. I think Greg uses that as well, right, Mondes? Yes, I do. That's exactly right. And I, I do it both open and MIS. It's the exact same technique. And for the fellows that are here, you know, uh, I always teach my fellows that, um, you know, there's the, the main thing to do is like, I, like most of these we're placing free hands. So like, we're not, we're not uh, doing anything special besides just trying to use our uh, anatomic landmarks and sticking the bolt in. But like, if it doesn't go in the first pass, I'm, I very quickly bring the fluoro into like a 30, 30 degree view we call the teardrop view. And then it gives you, it's like the biggest pedicle known to man once you see it and you realize, oh, wait a second. Like the, the place to place these bolts is actually a massive area. Um, so then we use that to, to, to guide us the rest of the way um, into the, into the ilium. But don't ever be afraid to bring in fluoro or if you're using that, don't, you know, obviously that changes things all together, but. You know, I, I might add to that, um, Greg, Greg, which is, bringing floral, but uh, that gets back to what Greg had suggested. It, it doesn't take that much more to just put your finger out over uh, the crest. So if you are struggling, it's a you know, pretty easy shot most of the time, but it would be worthwhile for people, especially if you did this in a cadaver lab, to, to feel the sciatic knots. So if you're not worth, if you're not used to operating around the pelvis, put a finger right in the sciatic notch. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty close. And so for people who don't do much operating around the pelvis, it's worth seeing that as the inferior border. And it's, it's pretty palpable. Especially yeah, Eric, for, like really weird windswept pelvises. Like, you know, when you're doing neuromusculars and they're tiny little wispy things, it can, it can be tough. It can be tough. Yeah, Eric, I, I agree. This is JC. I do the same hey. technique as you do. Hey, uh, now sort of sitting underneath the PSIS. And I think if we look at the data on iliac screws, there's a lot of it from, you know, 10, 12 years ago about how horrible they are and all the pain and loosening and prominence. And I think early in my career, I did have a fair amount of patients that we would eventually go back and remove them because they were quite a bit more prominent. But I think with this technique that you're describing that it sounds like a lot of us have adopted, I have not had those complaints. As you said, I think it's basically like an S2 ALAR screw. It just happens to reside within the ilium and we also do place ancillary rods and so it's a nice way to be able to do an s2 ai and a traditional iliac without having that prominence yeah good well the the uh i i love the idea that uh, we think you know we always think all these things that we're doing is novel and it turns out everyone does it the same way i must have been now i'm, I'm both uh, i'm both uh, uh pleased and horribly disappointed uh, uh all in the same <laughs> breath um, does it, I'm curious if anyone has a lot of experience with the S2 AI screws uh, and either then decided to move away to it because it sounds like a lot of the senior surgeons are kind of using this low start iliac bolt. Is there a time you used you used S2 AIs and then and then moved away from that, Greg? Yeah, I did. I, I used them for probably three years and I had tons of issues with them, mainly as they because the trajectory is fairly flat and so like. Uh, um, I found that a lot of my bolts actually sagged into it a lot more. I think the biomechanical, um, I think you showed some slides, you know, where you're, where it goes off at a much less acute of an angle to go into your bolt. I think the, I think the biomechanics of that are probably better in the long run than, um, the whole construct sitting on a horizontal, um, a bolt. Uh, that, like I said, that bone is not like amazing, right? It's the long screw that's really helpful. It's not like you're getting cortical purchase the whole way across. So there is some settling that can happen in there. We've lost some fixation and 
So I've not been super happy with that. And that's when Bert Yazde, one of the peach guys in town, was showing me how he did his, um, and it's exactly like you do yours, um, Eric. And I kind of converted my whole practice over to that about guess, five years ago or so. It's interesting. You know, I will say one other thing. If I can go mm-hmm. one more caveat, if you are intending to fuse the SI joint, though, like the S2 AI screw is really important because I think one of the reasons it was failing, Eric, to your point earlier, is that you only have one point of fixation across the SI joint. Well, that's not going to get you enough fixation to stabilize that joint, I think. I think it, there's a lot of rotation that can still happen around it. So if your intention is to fuse it, then uh, having two points of fixation across it's important, like using, uh, you know, whatever these, some of these, you know, sick reliac fixation devices are. Um, there's a study going on right now looking at that, but you need to use a second point of fixation for that, and that makes good scientific sense. Yeah. Well, I, and I think a lot of it also, to, you know, I think the SI joint in some ways even though we've shown, shown a light on it, still ends up being a little bit of a forgotten joint. I think if you do have one that is nearly arthrobeast or wants to arthrobeast, maybe that's one where you think about uh, going ahead and, and doing an S2AI and, and fusing the SI, that, that might be fairly clever uh, when you're thinking about doing those long constructs. I do find that if you secure around the SI joint, you do eliminate a lot of the motion there. And so even if they have some SI joint pain or dysfunction, it does seem to resolve even if you don't do a formal fusion across it. Um, I must admit that typically when I think about building my bony bridge um, from the spine, I usually think about building it not just to the, to the sacrum, but to the sacrum out to the ilium. I'll decorticate a bit of the ilium. And, uh, if it fuses up there, I call that, you know, that's a, that's a bonus. It gives you some extra stability, um, which, I think, uh, which I think is kind of nice. The, the only other thing I was going to say is that Larry Lanky a couple of years ago uh, at the SRS uh, showed that with S2 AI screws that there was a huge change in pelvic incidence that changed, uh, uh, pelvic tilt that <clears throat> changed <clears throat> from uh, pre-op to post-op and then uh, in that post-op period, I wonder if a, some of that isn't exactly as you described, Greg, some of that settling that occurred with those horizontal yeah. screws rather than it being a true reflection of, of something that was changing in the operating room. Do any of the fellows have any questions? Um, make sure you use the chat function or, or speak up. You know, it's really meant for you guys to interact. And, and uh, if you've seen stuff and while you've been in fellowship or got questions about this, uh, please, uh, please let us know. Ask Eric. Yeah, hi. This is Serena here. Serena Who here. I just want to make one comment. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Eric, I think it's great that okay. um, as, as you uh, – noted um it turns out that a lot of people are using this and um it's great technique and really good to you know modify what we what the problems were with the old iliac screws that we used to fit in like the galveston um i would say that for point even though we don't want the necessary joint is kind of critical for those patients keeping their fixations so um, that would be the one thing that I would want to just make sure we keep in mind for some of the osteoporotic patients, you know, the kind of the toggle in the iliac crest, um, you know, it can be, it might not be enough. So just keep the S2A screws in your armamentarium for some of those cases. So, so Serena, do you think the S2A screws are better in osteoporotic bone than, uh, than those straight iliac screws? Um, I would have to say that, um, you know, I haven't done a mechanical test, obviously, and yeah. I haven't had, honestly, a lot of failures in S2 AI screws, like, you know, um, a lot of us are, you know, kind of having these random ones and things. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I like that fixation. Um, I think it's nice to, you know, be able to just do it, do the, the screw as you described without having to cross the joint. Um, but yeah, I think I have a feeling that for certain numbers of, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, not everybody gets osteoporotic the same way and everybody's pel- pelvic configuration is just a little bit different. So, you know, if you're going down a fairly narrow pathway, like some of the CTs you showed, you'll get kind of sort of like an inter- intertable bite. But then other patients, they have, you, you know, you need to kind of, it's, it's more capacious and having that bite across the um, joint is more essential. So um, I think, again, having both in your armamentarium is helpful for these, these challenging patients. The, yeah, that's the, great. The, the pullout capacity of S2AI is considerably better than an iliac screw. However, pullout failure is not really, I think, how those screws are demanded of. So they are better screws if you're just looking at it purely biomechanically. 
not not necessarily in the way they're stressed. So well, it's interesting. They they probably get a heck of a bite with that with the right. The, there's a tremendous amount of sclerosis that occurs around the SI joint, and so you can imagine it's not just a right a unicortical screw, but instead it's a, that tricortical getting a bite on the sacrum, getting a bite on the ilium, and then getting a bite distally. So um, I think that's an interesting thought. I, you know, the other the other thing too is we uh, we're being very generic here, right? Uh, pelvis is a pelvis is a pelvis, and um, I think we would I think anyone that's that's uh, put a lot of screws in the pelvis would say that that is definitely not true, right? Uh, the android pelvis has had to be quite narrow. Um, this uh, low start iliac bolt is really easy in men because uh, the iliums usually kind of hang over the sacrum. Uh, in women, they can have a very broad brim, depending, again, the anatomical differences are, are, su are surprising. And sometimes the, the S2AI screw ends up lining up a dot nicer or you need to little violate a little bit of that posterior cortex to get things to line up uh, in line. So I like, I, I think the, the best point there is, the, the reason I showed all three is that there's there's never one right thing and you gotta look at the patient in front of you and maybe figure out the best way to, to deal with that problem. I, I like the idea of the osteoporosis. Maybe maybe that, maybe that is a time where we should be thinking about um, both time, types of fixation or additional fixation. It's a great idea. Hey, Bob Eastlack, when, when do you add the bedrock on this? Well, just mainly in the context of the study that we're involved in right now, but I, I definitely think about it a little more with the osteoporotic patient. I think the screws are demandative on the basis of the motion of the SI joint that, that uh, persists beyond just the fusion construct maturing. Um, I, I still don't know yet whether it's going to be something we, we favor long-term on a prophylactic basis. We, I, there's a lot about the clinical syndrome, we don't know because we just haven't looked at it or studied it. It might, might be worth describing that for some of the fellows because I think uh, perhaps a few people outside of uh, your group and, and ours uh, might have seen that on this call. On this call. Yeah, so um, what, what Sig's alluding to is that uh, there's been a little more awareness over the past several years that the sacroiliac joint um, is it suffers a bit of an adjacent segment failure uh, after fusion surgery, particularly long fusions, upwards of 20 or 30% of patients will have pretty symptomatic SI joints over years, probably progresses over time. It, uh, it seems to be uh, sort of proportionally related to the, to the uh, extent of stiffness of the lumbar spine. Uh, and on top of that, there's, there's a modest percentage of failures, whether it's uh, rod failures at the lumbosacral junction or below the S1 screws, uh, iliac or S2AI uh, screw failures, some sort of construct failure that is, we think, partially related to the ongoing stress or motion of the SI joint and the construct that bypasses it. So with that thought in mind, we're prospectively looking at deformity patients and uh, evaluating them for uh, SI joint pain, both before and after uh, deformity surgery. And then there's a randomized trial going on looking at prophylactically managing the SI joint with a, an attempted stabilization or fusion so that we can see whether that's uh, advantageous for long-term outcomes in these patients. So that, that's sort of the summary. Uh, jury's still out, sort of an exciting thing to figure out for, for deformity surgeons who see a lot of issues on the top and bottom of our constructs. Bob, is that you volunteering to give a, another West Coast Fellows Conference talk on SI joint fusion? Because we're looking for presenters. Certainly. Um, so uh, we're, we're running out of time here, guys. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kleinberg. I think this is exactly what Greg and I had in mind um, for, for a venue where we could talk about a high level topic, sort of a fellow level topic and really get into the details. Certainly I learned a lot. Um, we are going to uh, start having this conference every other month, as I mentioned. The next conference is scheduled for March 19th. Um, it's going to be Stefan Rue talking about radiation safety, which for those of us that do a lot of MIS is becoming uh, more and more salient. Um, so again, thanks for everybody that uh, logged on. We're going to try to keep it short with the goal being that each fellow can take two or three points away. Um, and uh, we'll hopefully see all of you in March. And um, I'll leave you with one last comment, which is uh, from Tupac. And I know fellowship can, can be hard, but you're here on the West Coast and, and just do your best and you should be okay. Bring in Tupac hard. What is the West Coast, Bob? That's right. <laughs> That's right, baby. West Coast. <laughs> um.
Yeah, I just wanted to give uh, one more shout out to Mai. Mai is, the, uh, uh, is coordinating this effort through the San Diego Spines Foundation. And thanks, Mai, for all your effort and time that you put into it, and Hanny for setting all this up. Uh, you guys rock. Have a great, have a great weekend, everyone. Stay thanks safe, everybody. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks, guys. Have a great day. Thanks a bunch, Eric. Thanks. Thank you, of course. Thanks, thanks everyone.